How do we take back America? We love talking about that, don't we? That's a, not exactly a new phrase. We gotta take back America, take back America. But what, what does that mean? And what should we prioritize? What should be the priority of the right moving forward? Obviously, Project 2025 is all over the news. We'll talk about that, obviously. That's gonna be part of it tonight. But there are many, many, many things we can tackle and should. I, I wanna clarify something before I get into any of these things, though. You, you need to be politically active. And that's when people come back and they say, in what way? What do you want me to do? Well, I'm about to talk about some big things we have to do as a country. But for you, whatever you can do, there's no limit. There's nothing, if I, if I address, I'm about to talk about debt and illegal immigration, just a heads up, but if you're doing something that doesn't address either of those things, you're still doing something. Whatever involvement you want or whatever involvement interests you, that's what you should do. Maybe it's running for office. Maybe you're an artist. Uh, maybe, I don't know what your thing is. Maybe, who cares? If you're involved, it matters. There are no battles, and I'm about to use a double negative, okay? Uh, there are no battles we shouldn't fight. That's how the communist has been so successful. He doesn't look at anything and says, well, no, nah, I'm not going to bother with that. No, that's stupid. No, 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 no. He's all in on all things at all times. So whatever the national GOP does, which they'll, of course, screw up, forget about them. You do something, all right? Now, let's, let's address the two things. My biggest things. There are a million things we could go into. My biggest things. First, debt. There are two things that can sink a nation of any size or strength, debt and illegal immigration. And oftentimes those two things go hand in hand. We even have people like Jerome Powell, who's a political hack out there saying things like this. Back in February, you were on 60 Minutes and you said the U.S. budget deficit, the national debt are, are unsustainable. Do you still view that the U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal path? I do. I, so I was, I think I tried to be clear that the level of the U.S. debt is not itself unsustainable, but the path that we're on is unsustainable, and I think that is uh, not controversial. Here's what's so wild about the debt situation. What he just said right there, it's unsustainable. Everyone in Washington, D.C. knows it. Republicans know it. Democrats know it. Because it's math. It's not an opinion. It's fact. We're not going to be able to make the payments. We're not going to be able to make the interest payments. We're, we're, and then it all comes apart. They all know it, and none of them want to stop it. I can't explain it. It's, it's as if we're, we're in a car with them, and they're driving, and we're heading right towards the cliff. And they know we should be stopping, put it in reverse. And instead, every time they get a chance, they jam down harder on the accelerator. I, it's one of the most maddening things in the world to me. None of them want to stop it. And please don't do the, well, Republicans will. I'll stop. Republicans spend just as much as Democrats every single time they have the Congress and the White House. They all do it. All of them. It floors me. No one wants to stop. No one wants to be the bad guy and say the party's over. And so this is where we're going. Debt. If we don't tackle the tough, unsexy problem of our national debt, well, what does any of the rest of this matter? And that brings me to the second thing. It doesn't matter how big, powerful a nation is. If you fill it up with barbarians from the third world, you will destroy the culture and destroy the nation itself. History is full of stories like this. And I, I, it brings me to this point, a point you've heard me make on this show many times before. I don't know how we get out of this, and this is what I mean. We'll set aside mass deportation and all that stuff. All that stuff's necessary and fine and good. But all that's fine. But this is Alejandro Mayorkas. I want, you, I want you to listen to this. Listen to this. President Biden, he campaigned on making a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system. Do you believe that that has been accomplished? We uh, work at that every single day across the Department of Homeland Security, across our administration, with our partners to the south and around the world. We have established more lawful, safe, and orderly pathways than any other administration, and we are working every day to strengthen the security of our border. 
how do we as a country recover from the fact that anytime Democrats take the White House now, they will open up the border and flood the country with the third world? Look, even if we win in November, all that stuff's great, fine, but how do we recover from that? If one of the two political parties is committed to bringing as many people into this country as possible, and the other political party is so weak and stupid that they won't stop them, and sometimes they'll help them do it, how do we come out of this? I, I don't know. And, and look, as I said, I could go into a million different things that should be the plan, take back America. We could talk about taxes. We could talk about pro-life issues, and we should. We should never be afraid about these things. We should talk about marriage, what it should be, what it shouldn't be. We, should, we could talk about, we should be bold enough to talk about everything and dig into everything. But I talk about debt and illegal immigration so much just because those are the things that will fill, finish us if we don't get them under control. And right now they're wildly out of control. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. Now, Project 2025, maybe it makes you uncomfortable. Do you actually know anything about it? Well, we're going to talk to Mark Hemingway about many things, Biden, country, the path forward, and we'll talk to Mark next. All that matters in this election, the only thing that matters in this election, is keeping Donald Trump and Project 2025 out of power. Keeping that in, in, insane ideology of white Christian nationalism and white supremacy and white male Christian dominance out of power. That's all that matters. I genuinely don't care who the Democratic nominee is, and I'm being real. I don't care. Biden has won before when people thought that he couldn't win. If you'll remember, he wasn't the guy that was running ahead of everyone. He can do this if we focus on the real threat. Project 2025, Donald Trump and MAGA America. Project 2025 will destroy America. Look it up. I'll tell you this. The communists do that very, very, very well. Always on message. All of them, same message over and over and over again. Granted, it's all lies and crap. You, you get that, but they are always on message. We could probably learn from that. But what is this big, scary white nationalist project 2025? <laughs> Joining me now, Steve Groves of the Great Heritage Foundation, part of this project 2025. The fact that it's heritage already tells me I'd probably want to wrap my arms around it and give it a big old sloppy kiss, but I don't know. Steve has to tell us what's on there. Steve, what's in this big scary project? I know it's it's so scary that uh, that about a hundred think tanks have got together and come up with a bunch of very conservative policy recommendations uh, for the next president that we hope that, uh, that he will adopt uh, once he wins in November. Um, it's it, there's nothing secret. There's no um, conspiracy going on behind closed doors. Uh, it's it's all written uh, right here in black and white. You know, we've got this this rather lengthy book called The Mandate for Leadership: The Conservative Promise uh, that's available for free online. Uh, should any of your uh, viewers like to get the, down to the details of what we're recommending, uh, but you're quite right about the left. Uh, getting on message. Uh, they want to attack uh, a project and, and say lies about the project and hang it around Trump's neck as if it was his idea uh, when it's not. It's a, it's a bunch of very committed conservative activists and policy analysts making recommendations to the next president. But by their reaction, you can tell we're over the target. No doubt you're over the target. So Give us a skinny on this whole thing, Steve. What is it? Obviously, I am familiar with it, but most people are not. All they get is uh, the, the lies, which they know are lies on CNN, but they don't know what this thing is. What's in it? What, what do you want done? Well, you know, when a president, uh, when a presidential candidate's running for office, they rarely have the time or the resources to think about the nitty gritty of policy implementation. So, what the Project 2025 has done is bring together 
thousands of conservative policy analysts, activists, and former Trump administration officials uh, to come up with policy recommendations for all of the agencies, uh, everything from the State Department to the Defense Department to Health and Human Services to housing and urban development, so that when the president wins in November uh, and it wins his reelection, there are thousands of recommendations available for him to consider uh, so that we can implement them, hit the ground running during that first 180 days of his second term. Uh, and so that's what it is. Uh, recommendations, very conservative, very well thought out recommendations with implementation plans. And we also uh, have a database of conservatives, thousands of conservatives who have come to Project 2025 and entered their resume and information into our database so that we can review them, vet them, interview them, and recommend them to serve in the next administration. So it's policy, it's personnel, it's recommendations. That's what Project 2025 is all about. I have noticed something in recent years that the left will oftentimes frame my views on things better than the right does. I saw this Nick Ackerman on MSNBC freaking out, and man, this sounded wonderful to me. Here he was. We know that Project 2025, it has an actual chapter on the Department of Justice and the installation of loyalists in the Department of Justice. And so, Nick, it would be a it would be a disaster of epic proportions if somebody like Trump is back in office with a blueprint like Project 2025 for the DOJ. No question about it. I mean, he's first of all going to get rid of all of these civil servants. I mean, he's basically going to eviscerate the entire civil service at the Department of Justice. Uh, is that on the table, Steve? Because that sounds fantastic to me. Well, what we're certainly going to do is uh, make sure that there are people at the Department of Justice who are dedicated to implementing President Trump's, uh, uh, his agenda. Uh, and the recommendations of personnel and the policy recommendations that we'll be making are designed to do just that. Uh, there is also something called Schedule F, which is something that the President Trump is already in favor of, where you take the top layers of the federal bureaucracy and make them more accountable to the president. Uh, during uh, the president's first term, there were layers and layers of bureaucrats that slow rolled and prevented and put up barriers to President Trump's agenda. This time around, the recommendations that Project 2025 are making are meant to prevent that from happening again in the sequel. And President Trump has already uh, expressed a, a desire to, to implement something like Schedule F. So Ackerman uh, is, is right to that extent. We are going to assert control over the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is not an entity unto itself. It is not a branch of government unto itself. It is part of the executive branch, which is led by the president. Trump himself came out and said, hey, I don't know anything about this. I don't have anything to do with this. This is not me at all. Now, I simply took that as Trump campaigning, trying to play defense against what they're trying to dump on him. But what do you make of that statement? Well, as you see, the, the lies that the left and the Democrats are telling uh, are twofold. They want to lie about Project 2025 and make it out to be something that it's not. And then they want to hang those lies over President Trump's neck as if these were his ideas. Both of these things are lies. This is a separate independent project of uh, thousands of conservatives who are making recommendations to President Trump. These lies the left and President Biden have been telling may have become a distraction. Uh, the last thing you want when you're campaigning for president is to have a distraction. Uh, but uh, that doesn't change any of the fundamentals of, of Project 2025. The recommendations, the implementation plans, the personal recommendations, they will all still be at President Trump's disposal when he wins in November. And we'll, we'll take it up then uh, and fight back against the left's lies and Biden's lies. Biden tweeted something about Project 2025, and he goes, look, go on the internet and look it up, and then gave a false URL to a website set up by Democrat lefty activists 
that made lies about Project 2025. So the lies about the project go all the way up to the Oval Office. It's on Twitter today. Biden's lies. Well, con well, congratulations to you for getting so much publicity for Project 2025, courtesy of the Dirty Commies. How do we get a GOP willing to implement any of these things, Steve? Look, I love them. I love going down the list, hard to find very many arguments in there, but what we lack is the spine to implement these things, at least from what I've seen. Well, there's an old saying in Washington that goes back years, personnel is policy. President Trump uh, learned some hard lessons uh, during his first term, lessons that he's been able to ruminate on for the past three and a half years, choosing the right cabinet officials, choosing the right senior officials, that's the most important thing that a president can do to ensure that the president's vision and the president's agenda gets implemented and is not blocked, is not slow rolled by people that disagree with it. If you're a cabinet official, if you're a senior official in the government, and even if you are a senior bureaucrat in the executive branch, your job is not to question and block the president's agenda. Your job is to implement it. So we need to oh, find yeah. those conservatives. Part of Project 2025 is to find those conservatives, ask them to sign up to our personnel database so that they can be vetted and recommended for roles in the next administration. Let's cross our fingers. Steve, thank you, sir. I appreciate you very much. Steve Groves. All right. Mark Hemingway is going to join us next. We have more to talk about. Hang on. Just another reminder for every single person watching, there is no such thing as a secular school. That is not a thing that exists anywhere. It's not a thing that can exist. Your school, the school Aiden, Jaden, and Braden go to, it will have a religion, I promise you. You best make sure it's yours. And I love what we've been seeing lately. Some states, two states, are getting the Ten Commandments back into the classroom, Oklahoma being one of those states. And joining me now, Ryan Walters, superintendent for the state of Oklahoma. Ryan, it's your state, your schools. Why don't you tell everyone what you did and why you did it? Thank you, Jesse. Really pre appreciate you having me on. You know, what we did is, you know, we look back at what's going on in the classroom and what's been clear to me is we've had state-sponsored atheism. I mean, they have literally gutted any reference to the Bible, any reference to, to Bible verses, scripture, and our history. And we're not going to tolerate it here in Oklahoma. So what we've done is we went back in and said, look, every class, you're going to have the most read book in American history. You're going to have the most cited book in American history, the most purchased book in American history in your classroom. We're going to put a Bible back in every classroom and teachers will teach from the Bible. How else do you teach? Why'd the pilgrims come to America? How do you teach that without the Bible? How do you teach that our rights come from God without any concept of, of what the Bible says? The historical precedents, I, I've, you know, the, the left can be offended. They can be mad. They cannot like it but they cannot rewrite our history. And what we're doing to our kids is unbelievable that we have lied to them about the influence the Bible had on American history. We will teach it in Oklahoma. We're proud to be the first state to put it back in every classroom. I love that you did it. Where did the idea for this come from? Because so many people woke up and were stunned. I woke up and cheered, but it's not something that has been done, sadly, for a very long time. Why this? Why now? Yeah, you know, we've been going over for about a year now looking at our social study standards okay. uh, to see how we can improve them. And we had we had uh, religious leaders reach out to us and go, hey, what's going on in our history classes where they, they never mention the Ten Commandments? And, you know, when they're talking about law and where law came from, they don't talk about the Bible when they're discussing. You have presidential speeches. I mean, re even a Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. You, nearly every president is routinely citing Bible verses. You have folks that, that were constantly referencing the Bible. And, and so we had groups to reach out to us and said, look, why isn't this being referenced in a classroom? I said, that's a really great question. So we begin to do a deep dive and it's clear to us that our kids aren't learning our history because the radical left, the teachers union has said, you know what, you can talk about any other influence you want, but you can't mention the Bible. And they have just used uh, left-wing attorneys to target any teacher that references a scripture or Bible verse. And they have just, 
you know, either intentionally on in some cases, or then in some they've intimidated teachers into pulling them out of the classroom. And, and, and frankly, it is academic malpractice to teach a history class about American history and not be talking about the Bible and its historical context. That is a fact. I do wonder why people like Becky Pringle of the NEA, National Education Association, I do wonder why she wouldn't want the Ten Commandments. Anyway, this is Becky Pringle. We can do this work. We must do this work. We get to do this work. We will do this work because our students are depending on us to win all the things. NEA, we have to win all the things, all the things, all the things. Our colleagues are depending on us to win all the things. Keep going, NEA, to preserve our democracy. We must win all the things. Delegates, we won't go back. We will keep going forward because we are the NEA. We are the NEA. We are the NEA. Are the NEA. And that's what we do. Ryan, is it the job of the public education system to, uh, well, how'd she put it, preserve democracy? Look, you know, it's amazing to me. By the way, uh, you'll love this, Jesse. Last year, I took her commence her little video that she did last year at the conference, and I sent it out, put, made it public, sent it out, sent it out to all the teachers and the teachers' union. Go, this is an Oklahoma values, guys. And we had a drastic uh, down, downgrade in the amount of folks signed up to the teachers' union because they, they also, in red states, they lie about this. She just told you who she is. It is all about power and money and pushing an ideology for them. They couldn't care less about student test scores. They couldn't care less about understanding our history. They want to lie about our history, make kids hate this country, turn kids on their own family. And, and again, they're about power and money. I mean, she's very clear, isn't it? It's about winning and winning for them is to have the ultimate power and control over families and society and to and continue to enrich themselves by taking money out of every teacher's pocket in the country. And they'll stop at nothing to attend their Marxist goals. And again, at their own conference, they're pretty upfront about it. How do we how do we change the government school system? Look, I would be honest, if it was up to me, we wouldn't have one, but we do have one. It's part of American culture now. But how do we change it into something where kids can learn to read and write and not, as you just say, learn to hate their country and their parents and everything that's normal? Yeah, I mean, you have to come in, and this is what we've done in Oklahoma, at a very aggressive agenda. I came into an agency that I came in and fired 130 people. I was like, look, we don't need an agency this big in education. There's no reason for it. We're trying to get power back to the families. And frankly, we don't need a federal department of education at all. The founders would be mortified to, to learn that we have a federal department of education. That needs to be abolished. Power should be returned completely to the states in education, and the states should do what we do. We give as much power, all the power, to the families. You choose the school, you choose the curriculum, and, and frankly, you hold the schools accountable. We will make the schools transparent with every dollar they spend, with every piece of curriculum they have, and we will absolutely hold people accountable who push an agenda, a left-wing agenda on your kids. And Jesse, I wanna point this out as well. In Oklahoma, we say, listen, we're not just passing a law here or a law there, and you know, you do what you want. I am pulling the certificates of teachers who break our critical race theory law, who push transgender ideology on kids. We have threatened the entire um, accreditation of two school districts that tried us by going ahead and pushing radical left-wing ideology that, that's against the law too. And we say, hey, you won't be a school district anymore if you continue to do this. You have to have teeth to these measures. The left is willing, they won't, they will, there's nothing they're not willing to do to indoctrinate their your kids because for them it's all about that next election and getting power and they know if they control the youth they control that so you have to be very aggressive you have to have a very uh, uh, aggressive agenda to go in gut the teachers unions get them out of the schools empower parents and then hold those individuals accountable that are left-wing activists masquerading as teachers gosh ryan walters it's everything i can do not to stand up and cheer right now that was freaking awesome exact kind of mentality we have thank you for what you're doing very much very much appreciate you that was awesome that's the kind of mentality we have do you hear what he said teeth that's what we need go in and start firing people make some enemies all right we're not quite done we'll be back
One thing's for sure about our path forward as we try to work things out here, we have to be bold. You know, putting the Ten Commandments back in classrooms and making kids learn about it, that's a bold step. And that's what it's going to take. Don't think we can lurch left for as long as we've lurched left and then kind of tippy-toe our way back right and accomplish anything. We have to be bold. And more than anything, we have to be willing to make ourselves and them uncomfortable. If you think we can comfortable our way back into where we need to be, you are sorely mistaken. We must take big, bold steps to save this country, and I believe we can. All right? All right. We'll do it again.